Good morning, dear saints, and blessed Epiphany. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Thursday, February 1st, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Today we are continuing our uh, study through the book of Lamentations with chapter 4. Now this chapter vividly describes the dire state of the city and its people. It talks about how the streets of Jerusalem, once bustling with the joyous laughter of children, are now silent and desolate. The gold and sacred stones of the temple, symbols of the city's wealth and faith, are now scattered and tarnished, mirroring the fallen state of the nation. Throughout this chapter, there's an underlying lament for the loss of the city's glory and mourning over the sins that led to such devastation. It urges us to reflect on our own lives in the light of God's unwavering love and justice. Well, folks, whether it's over the air, online at kfuo.org, or as a podcast, it doesn't matter to me how you tune in. I'm just glad you're here. You're the reason we're here. So open your hearts and your minds. We're about to begin. Thy Strong Word is graciously supported in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF translates, publishes, and distributes books that are Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Reformation-driven. So when you get a moment, go online and see them at lhfmissions.org. And if you have any questions or comments about today's show, or maybe you just want to say hi, email me, pastorboo at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook, too, or you can even phone us. Today we're live, 1-800-730-2727. Joining me this morning is the Reverend Brian Wolfmuller, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church and Jesus Lutheran Church of the Deaf, in Austin, Texas. Good morning, Pastor Wolf Muller, and, and thanks for being on the program again. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Excited to be live, too. Oh, yes. Always fun to be live. You know, we uh, kind of have to watch what we say because, you know, if we make any mistakes, it's out there. There's nothing we can do. But that's okay because we I, I make li- mistakes all the time. I like the risk. It's good. <laughs> me, me, too. Well, brother, would you just start our time off together in prayer and then we'll just dive in? Absolutely. Uh, Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it, that by the patience and the comfort of your Holy Word we might embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of eternal life, which you've given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Well, we finished up chapter three yesterday, and now we're, you know, finding our way into chapter four. Uh, Chapter three had a little shift from the previous chapters where previously Jeremiah had been speaking a very personificationally, (laughs) I don't know, but he was speaking about Jerusalem, the people in as a whole, um, talking about, you know, the daughter of Zion this beautiful princess who was covered now in clouds. But then in chapter three, it gets real personal. You could almost see Jeremiah sitting on the banks, watching the, watching the city burn as he wrote these, as he wrote these words, you know, and, and he was still able to muster up, even though he said things like my soul is bereft of peace and I have forgotten what happiness is. He also said things like, the steadfast love of Yahweh never ceases and his mercies never come to an end and that it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And that was a pretty long chapter all the way through 66, but now it seems like the shift has gone back. Now we're focused back on what's going on in the city. Uh, what else should the people know as we head into to chapter four? Well, I always think it's uh, good to look at the overall structure and you see, uh, when you see, for example, 22 verses, say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on there? Remembering there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet and that a lot of times one of the uh, most classic forms of Hebrew pro- poetry is this acrostic where you you A, B, C, begin each line with a, a letter. So whenever you see a psalm or a, a po- poetic section that has 22 verses or I'd say a uh, uh, a multiple of 22, like 66 in in chapter 3, then you wonder if there's an acrostic that's happening. And in fact, that's the case. Chapter 1, 2, 3, 
it's a triple acrostic and four are acrostics. Chapter five, interestingly, has 22 verses, but is not an acrostic. So that throws you off. Uh, and that'll be interesting, I think, for you guys to think through tomorrow, what that means, how how that um, structure is kind of just like the city. It's just all out of whack. But it's, it is an amazing thing to, to consider this orderly structure in the midst of all of this disorder. In a way, though, the Word of God is what is what orders our lives. And even as Jeremiah is lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem and this anger of God poured out on his own people and his own city, the place that he chose to cause his name to be remembered so that he could come to them and bless them, when the Lord's pouring out his wrath and there's all this chaos, it's, it's now reordered by the Lord's Word. We see that in this chapter, too, because just like chapter 3, now chapter 4, it's this classic form of lament. I mean, it it goes to the depths of our human experiences of suffering and defeat, and yet it it ends with the praise of God, and it ends with a note of hope. I mean, here in chapter 4, it's kind of funny because the hope is the destruction of Edom. <laughs> the, you know, the enemies of the Lord, which are over there laughing as they watch the Lord's wrath visited on those guys. Uh, well, it's going to come on you too. But if it if that wrath is going on to Edom, that means it's leaving Jerusalem. And and so there's a, 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 a kind of climax of hope that also is going to be in, in this chapter too. So, uh, so those are a few things to to look at in the sort of the overall structure and the big picture. And it is, it is a poetic depiction of something that's really happening. And, and while the language isn't explicit, I do want folks at home to know that there's some pretty uncomfortable images that we'll be talking about as we go through this. So just keep that in mind. But let's head right into the text. And as uh, uh, Pastor Wolfmuller already said, this is 22 verses. So this is just sort of the standard acrostic. We are going to start with Aleph and verse 1. How the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold is changed. The holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. The precious sons of Zion worth their weight in fine gold, how they are regarded as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hands. Even jackals offer the breast, they nurse their young, for the daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives it to them. The one who once feasted on delicacies perishes in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple embrace ash heaps. For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment and no hands were wrung for her. I'm just going to pause right there. Obviously, it's still in the middle of a thought, but just trying to break it up here. So we're in verse six now. So heading back to one, you know, even the imagery, you know, it turned very personal in the previous chapter. He's talking about how he felt in the midst of this or even how the average uh, Hebrew would have felt. And now it's like he's just looking around what's left of the city and and the holy stones are just sort of strewn in the street. Um, it, it gets worse, but just starting there, the place of God, the place where they could rely on God to be found, it's it's seemingly destroyed. Does that mean God has gone from them too? I couldn't imagine what was going through their their hearts. Yeah, the you know, the history of Israel is like a roller coaster. And um, it, there's maybe two things to stop before we we get to where we're going here to just to mention. The first is in Deuteronomy, the Lord is, as he's sending the people into the promised land, he's preaching to them through Moses, and he says, look, I'm giving you commandments. I'm setting before these commandments before you, and there's two ways to go. You can go the way of the commandments, which is the way of life, or you can go another way, which is the way of death. And if you go this way of life, here's the things that are going to happen both naturally and also supernaturally, here's the blessings that you can expect. If you go the other way, here's the things that you can expect. And and um, difficulty, destruction, uh, deportation, there's a kind of a escalating series of threats that are going to happen. Well, the people entered into the promised land, it's a lot of ups and downs, but it, it, it culminates in, this, in the time of Solomon, which is the next stop I kind of want to make, where 
when the scriptures describe the time of Solomon, they say that there's the, the gold is like copper. Everything's in Jerusalem is covered in gold. There's such the wealth of all the nations is flowing into Jerusalem, and there's such this this great time of abundance. No one lacks food. No one lacks drink. No one lacks clothing. Everyone has all that they need, and it's a a picture of God's blessings. Now it's not that long after. I mean, we're probably from the from the high pole point of Solomon's kingdom, let's say that's 950, the building of the temple, the the marrying of the Queen of Sheba, the all the uh, sons of all the kings of all the nations sending their kids to the University of Solomon in Jerusalem, this this high point of of history. Now, uh, well, 400 years later, we're five six five eighty six five eighty seven. Uh, that that Jerusalem is in ruins, and it's been falling apart for a long time. It was Solomon was the time of gold, and then the time of, time of silver, then the time of bronze, and then the time of wood, and then the time and of clay. And it, so it's been uh, getting poorer and poorer. It's been getting um, the the all the its glory has become more and more diminished until now it's it's utterly destroyed, and and that um, the bitterness of it is is put forth in this poem to show how far they've fallen. So when it talks about, in verse 1, how dark the gold has become, it's it's remembering how good it once was, comparing it to how bad it is now. And um, and, and so that that contrast is is the bitter cry of the of this lament and it's and it's put forward in us in really explicit and and terrifying terms well and what's more important uh, than gold and what's more important than stones even holy stones and that's the people and that gets us to verse 2 right the precious sons of zion who are worth their weight in fine gold they're like earthen pots right the things that if it broke you're not going to fix it you're just going to throw it away they're just tossed aside earthen right. vessels easily broken easily discarded so you could see how it's not just sort of oh we used to have the 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 wealth of solomon it's like even the people and then we get this in verse three even jackals offer the breast right even they take care of their children but the daughter of my people has become cruel, and it describes starving infants and starving children. Um, I, I don't know that it needs unpacking, but explain to us exactly what's going on here. I mean, help us understand just how awful the results of this, of this, uh, I guess, um, them being carted off is. Right. Well, it it's one thing, Phil, to think about this, how, you know, it's, look, the jackals nurse their babies, but the babies of Zion they don't get fed they're dying of starvation because of this great a deprivation which has happened in the city i mean it's it's horrible to imagine but how much more horrible it would it be to imagine if those babies were being starved to death when they it wasn't because there was a lack of resources it wasn't because they were being carted off as war um uh, prisoners it was just because the babies were unwanted which has to do with this question of the value of the human person, which is what's brought forth in verse two. Really amazing. I mean, the application for us to consider is really great. Is a, Do we consider the person to be, how does it say it here, uh, worth their weight in gold or regarded like clay pots? You know, is this the fine, do we consider people to be fine china or do we consider people to be the, uh, you know, the toilet bowl? <laughs> uh, what, what What is our valuation of the human? And one of the problems that we're living with now is that we we treat human beings as something to be thrown out and um and it's not because we're being carted off as prisoners of war just because we're so invested in our own self-interests that anything that would threaten that uh, has to, has to be warred against so it has some application to some of our contemporary questions but but here in this time it's uh, in this time of being, like you said, taken off into exile or left behind in, to sit in the ruins, it, it shows, the, um, the, again, the huge fall that the city has experienced. It's collapsed now, and it's collapsed because the Lord has visited them with his wrath. So it's, it receives this affliction from the hands of God. And that's one of the things that this lament will do for us as we are still setting the stage a little bit. It'll, 
it'll set the afflictions of the people in the context of God's holiness and God's righteousness. And this is important for us too, because one of the things that happens is in the midst of our own afflictions and troubles, we're trying to figure out what it all means. And it's not self-interpret. Uh, suffering is not self-interpreting. It doesn't come with embedded meaning. We got to, we got to sort it out. Well, we want to let the Lord's word actually instruct us so that we can understand our own suffering and affliction, both in the context of God's holiness and also in the context of his, of his righteousness or his comfort, his peace. And the, the poem is setting the stage to do that for us beautifully. Well, and I don't want to let um, go by your application because I do think it's important. And I also want to make clear, at least the way I'm reading this, um, back to verse three real quick. He says he talks about the jackals. He talks about nursing their young. And it doesn't seem to me that it's just that because of the cruel situations, the children are starving, but rather the people are abandoning their children. The daughter of my people has become cruel, like these senseless ostriches, a beast that doesn't care for its kids. So it seems like there there is a, a sense of self-preservation among the people where they're neglecting their infants. Um, am I reading too much into that? No. In fact, in these times of sieges, you hear even worse, like, you, you know, that, 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 that kind of in the midst of, it, this deprivation, um, the the instinct for preservation kicked in in such profound ways that there was even cannibalism and and other sort of really horrible things that would happen. But, but, so there's a but you're right there is a cruelty there, so that the natural affection what we call storge that's the Greek word for it it's the natural familial affection this desire to to um, serve those which are close to us that's that's all gone. And the, the reason for it is um, not explicitly uh, outlined, although uh, it's so it's just identified here. And the result is a condemnation that it, 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 it strikes hard for us. But um, I think it would be even more profoundly insulting for the people then. This is worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. So that so that when Jeremiah wants to show the wickedness of the people and how far they've fallen, he's going to come up with the worst comparison that he could possibly make. Jesus will do the same to Bethsaida and Chorazin in his own preaching. It's worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's the that's the slap in the face that's about to be delivered to the parents, especially the moms here, uh, who have, as you mentioned, have become cruel. And I think about the circumstances around which they perhaps have given in to this temptation to be cruel, and yet when we compare it to our modern times and the destruction of children in the womb, it's almost for the exact opposite. Is that it, Here it's out of the desire for survival, which doesn't make it right, but now it seems it's out of the desire for luxury or convenience. And, um, and, and, and I don't want to lean into that too much, but I just – yeah, I just wanted to push what you were saying a little harder to say, yes, we – the cruelty can come not just because these people are in a bad situation. We see the same cruelty even in the most wealthy and, and, and the most well-off country in the world. And how much worse it would it is than for us. I mean, so that Jeremiah would say, look, you're, I mean, the blood of all the babies murdered in the womb and, and now the blood of all the elderly people who are murdered in their, in, in their beds um, because to, to it, quote, in suffering, all this blood, it, it um, I think it would apply here worse than the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a, it should be a frightful thing for us to hear as well. Yeah, in time, had the scriptures been written in a different place, perhaps Jeremiah here would be saying that you know what's hap what you're doing is worse than the sins of the Americans. But we will keep on going, and uh, so we see that those who once feasted on delicacies perished in the street. Those who once brought were brought up in purple right the rich folks they now wear ash heaps for the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of sodom and sodom all right let's keep on going with verse seven her princes were purer than snow whiter than milk their bodies were more ruddy than coral the beauty of their form was like sapphire now their face is blacker than soot they are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become dry as wood. 
Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger who wasted away, pierced by the lack of the fruits of the field. The hands of the compassionate women, they have boiled their own children and they became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. Yahweh gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger and he kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. That's the end of verse 11. So obviously bearing the lead, which is they're boiling their own children. But even before it builds up to that, it talks about like the nobleman being like the, you know, all all the men were uh, above average and all the women were good looking. Right. So, I mean, these guys, super good looking. They had these beautiful forms. And now even these rich, wealthy, handsome men, you could you wouldn't pay attention. Not only do those things not matter, of course, in such a situation, but 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 they're just um They're shriveled away. Even the very wealthy, and to use a modern term, privileged, did not escape the destruction or the results of this destruction. Yeah, we see the rhetorical structure of the of the passage here. It's a it's really a a series of before and after photos, you know. And and the before and after photos can sometimes be good. Like, you know, here was the place before, here's after. But this is this is not that. This is a before and after. Like here's before the tornado hit, and here's after the tornado hit. Here's before the house caught on fire. Here's after the house caught on fire. So this before and after picture of Jerusalem. Here's before, during the time of of peace. Maybe during the time of Solomon. During the time of of the Lord's um, kindness. And here's after, after the visitation of the Lord's wrath. So before the children were. Uh, fat and well fed. Now they're begging for food. The, b- before they were feasting on delicacies. Now they're dying in the street. Now those who were raised in dressed in the finest of clothes in pur- you have the kids all dressed in purple. Purple is the is this rare rare color to get as a dye in the ancient world. I think they had to get some sort of coral and process it in some certain way. Uh, for a long, long time until they sorted out how to do another purple, like in um, where Leipzig, I think, figured out how to do a purple dye. But that wasn't until like the early Middle Ages. So yeah, this whole purple was very, very fine clothes. And the, it's normally what the kings are wearing. But look, the kids are dressed in purple in Jerusalem. And now they have ashes heaped on their head. This, this, this is this before and after. And it's and it's going to continue. There's princes that were purer than snow. This has to do with whiter than milk. Probably this is the beauty. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. So red forms, it looks great. Beauty was like sapphire. Now their faces are blacker than soot. They're not recognized in the street. Their skin is shriveled. They become dry as wood. So they used to be healthy and now emaciated. And again, the before and after. And so, and so bad is it now. You look at the this list of the before and after. On the after side, there's so much misery that the uh, Jeremiah says the victims of the sword were happier than these people, the victims of hunger, who wasted away, pierced by the lack of fruit of the field. So it's it's better if they just killed you right there with a the sword than than having to die by wasting away because there's nothing to eat. And then here's the worst before and after. You have the picture of before with the women whose hands are compassionate and loving and caring for their children. And now it's hard, It's even hard. They're cooking their children. Oh, and it makes you shudder. It almost makes you sick to your stomach to, to see how bad it is, how... Uh, I mean, the, the the after picture is bad enough already, but when put in contrast with the before, it's just, oh, and it's th- this is the the full vent of the Lord's wrath, the pouring out of His hot anger. That's verse eleven. The fire that He can kindles in Jerusalem, and all of it is also in this backdrop of the fact that the Lord is the one who's established Zion and built the city. He he put David there, said, put my kingdom, put my house in Jerusalem. I've chosen it for the place. And the people, this is one of the things that Jeremiah is always preaching against, and also even Isaiah and the other prophets. The people are saying, look, God promised the Messiah would be in Jerusalem. God promised all these things would happen in Jerusalem, and they haven't happened there. So Jerusalem will stand. We're safe in Jerusalem. They were misusing the promises of God 
to support their lack of repentance. They were abusing the promises of God against God's call to, to repentance. And the danger is that they were, they were caught in their pride. The, the Lord was warning them, look, I can make a shoot come from the stump of Jesse. In other words, don't think I'm not going to cut down this tree. I can keep my promises and cut down this tree. I can keep my promise that the Messiah will be in Jerusalem and still destroy Jerusalem. So don't, don't misuse my promises against my commands. And yet they did that, and, and this wrath of God comes on them as a, as a shock and a surprise. The Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger. You know, we think of Ezekiel, thus shall my anger spend itself, and I will vent my fury upon them and satisfy myself, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. And he's a jealous God. Um, what do we say to those who look at this and say, no good God would allow this to happen, especially to the people he chose? This is more than discipline. This is just torture. Uh, you know, this is the problem of evil, and of course we want to try to figure out some theodicy by which, and that's, that's come up a couple of times in the show. But, you know, w when you get to, like, the, the temple being destroyed, okay, well, now the people are being driven off. Well, okay. Well, now the rich people are being thrown down. Oh, that's not good. Well, now the kids are starving. Oh, that's bad. Well, now women are boiling their children. It, it, it becomes so heinous and, and so egregious that even the strongest person of faith has to step back and go, I cannot even fathom something like that happening. And I don't know. What do you say to those folks? Well, it's, so there's always a disconnect between how we imagine things to be and how things actually are. I think the problem of evil, there's a lot of ways to, to, to run at the problem and, and see, and see how it shakes out. So there's a lot of different things that we can say, although it doesn't make it go away. It, it remains a problem. So there's no solution, if you will, but just sort of ways to understand it. I think one of the ways to think about it is that the problem of evil offends our idea about how things are, but it matches up pretty well with the reality of how things are. In other words, things are bad. This life is often full of misery. There's the reality of of crime. There's the reality of abuse. There's the reality of, of horrendous things. And, and if we look at the Bible, here's how, here's, I think that maybe the way to think about it. If you just sit in the room and you say, say you've never looked at how the world really is. You're just sitting, sitting in a room, there's a window, you've never looked out the window. And if you just think about God and his almightiness and his goodness and everything, and then you, and you imagine how things ought to be, and you look out the window, things are very different than you expect. But if you read the Bible about how God created the world and how we fell and how things are in this fallen world and what the Lord is doing about it to bring about restoration until the final moment of the uh, resurrection and the redemption of the world, if you read the Bible and you look out the window, you're like, oh yeah, that's about what I expected. There's some good days and some bad days, some nice people and some horrible people, some uh, things to celebrate and some things that you can barely stand to, to look at. And, uh, and this is how the Bible describes reality. So what we're dealing with in the scriptures and what we're dealing with in our own lives, it, it might not match up with an abstract idea of the goodness of God, but it does match up with the story that the Bible tells us about the history of the world, which we're in. And, and I think it's safe to say, too, that we've domesticated God so much that when the true wrath of God, which we should, by the way, be rightly afraid of, except that we have Christ, then then when that when that shows up, we start to think, well, that's not fair. You know, the, the ground opens up and he swallows up all of these men, women and children in the Old Testament. And, and people go, oh, well, I don't I, I can't believe in a God who would allow that. Well, it's not really yours to believe in or to not believe in. I mean, God is God. His judgment is that it's it's not injustice against the people who deserve it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we're, we're gonna, with that somber note, we're going to have to leave that for the break. But folks, don't go anywhere. We'll unpack more of this when we come back. Pastor Wolf Muller and I are in Lamentations chapter four. See you on the other side.
These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend Brian Wolfmuller, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church and Jesus Lutheran Church of the Deaf in Austin, Texas. Friends, don't forget, you can reach out to me at pastorboo at gmail.com or on Facebook with your questions, comments, and more. You can also give us a phone call, 1-800-730-2727. Okay, Pastor Wolfmuller, back to the text you know, I just kind of ended on this idea that we have to remember that God is in control. And we went into this at great length yesterday and, frankly, the episode before. Um, but we're going to keep on going because we, we see here that while God is the one who, in this case, we know for a fact has sent this upon them, or in our cases, his divine will certainly has things happen in this world. And we don't always know the exact reason why. Um, and we're going to find that, well— People shouldn't have been surprised. Let's start with verse 12. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor did any of the inhabitants of the world, that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. This was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed in their midst of her, in the midst of her, pardon me, the blood of the righteous. They wandered blind through the streets, and they were so defiled with blood that no one was able to touch their garments. Away, unclean people cried at them, away, away, do not touch. So they became fugitives and wanderers, and people said among the nations, they shall stay with us no longer. Yahweh himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. No honor was shown to the priests, no favor to the elders. Our eyes failed, ever watching vainly for help. In our watching, we watched for a nation which we could not save. They dogged up our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end drew near. Our days were numbered for our end had come. That's verse 18. Hmm. So, you know, I, no one thought that Jerusalem could endure what's happening, or sorry, that couldn't endure. No one thought that they would be able to break down the gates. But it says very explicitly, the prophets, the priests, they have a lot of the blame. Why? Yeah, that's, this has to do with that thing that we mentioned earlier, that there was oftentimes a false, um, a pride in Jerusalem connected to the promises of God. It's one of the ways, I was thinking about this, I'm working on republishing a book, um, old book from the 1700s called The Precious Bible Promises. And it just sets forth all these great promises of God. But reflecting on that, I have to think about how the promises of God can be misused. And they can be misapplied, misunderstood, but also misused in this way, that we use the promise of God against the Word of God or even a, we use the promise against the command. So the people in Jerusalem would say, well, look, here's the prophets saying that Jerusalem is threatened and Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. And they'd say, Jerusalem can't be destroyed. God promised that the Messiah would come forth from Jerusalem. Now, it's a weird thing to say, but I think we do this, th and so we have to look at it very carefully, We because we do the same thing. It's a weird thing to say that, well, I believe in this promise of God, that the Messiah will come from Jerusalem, and I'm going to use that against this other word of God, which says that um, you shouldn't kill, for example, or whatever. You shouldn't teach false doctrine. You shouldn't worship false gods. We'll say, well, look, uh, I don't have to worry about sinning because God has promised that we're not going to be destroyed. It's, uh, I suppose, it's like the, the, the kids who say, well, mom and dad said they're not going to be back till 11, so we'd throw a party or do whatever we want in the meantime. It's like you're using the promises of God against the commands of God, and that's what Jerusalem was doing. So they had this 
this, they, they were misusing the promises to support their sin. Uh, they were misusing the promises of God to, to have this arrogance and this false sense of security. And the Lord sent the prophets to disabuse them of that because the promises are always pushing us towards repentance, sorrow for sin, faith in Christ, and the fruit of repentance, love for God, love for the neighbor, quietness and suffering. So, so the so the scriptures are and, and God through the His Word, His prophets and apostles is always pushing us towards that, not towards this false sense of security. So, the people said, "Hey, look, Jerusalem can't be destroyed. It has it's built. It's protected by God's promises." Well, His promises do not protect your sin. His promises do not protect your murdering and adulterous idolatry. His promises don't protect your licentiousness and your own sense of entitlement. His promises are pushing towards repentance and faith, not towards indulgence or despair. And so that indulgence of the of the kings, and here specifically in verse 13, the prophets and the priests uh, has to be exposed and, and punished with a severity that is, we might say, well, it's over the top, but that's because this abuse of office has done such profound damage. I mean, it's one thing if the normal people are embracing false doctrine, but if the prophets that God has sent, and if the priests that God has put in office are teaching falsely, then then the damage is is is, is ex, uh, kind of expanded. It's even worse. I think there's a message for us, those of us who are in positions of teaching and positions of preaching and and leadership, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, we have this duty out there to proclaim the truth of God and not be swayed by the the peace, right? So so if there's peace going on, you you, you kind of don't want to upset that cart. If things are prosperous, you don't want to you don't want to get people upset for no reason. That's a, a human nature. And I think we we find out elsewhere in Scripture that that's exactly what was going on. I mean, you know, they didn't want to upset the apple cart. Things were going fine. As you said, who can touch us, right? God, God, God's protecting us. If God is for us, who could be against us? Um, and yet the truth is everybody's against you because God is for you. And yet if you rely on those promises, that's certainly nothing wrong with relying on those promises. But if you rely on them to the point where you say, well, now it doesn't matter how I live or what I believe or how I honor God, then, you know, you're, you're going to be open to his wrath. And that seems to be exactly what's happening here. I, applying it to our own nation today, as I try to do, because, you know, we don't live in Israel anymore. We live here in the United States of America. You know, what what might be the message for for folks out there? I mean, I know we just can't drop it in, you know, without some interpretation, but but how can we learn in our lives today from this situation? Yeah, there. So uh, first, you mentioned we can't just drop it in. We can't just, uh, you know, slip, uh, uh, flip flop uh, Israel and the United States because Israel was founded for different purposes and had different promises. We don't have an explicit word of God for the United States, so we don't know. Uh, we don't have an explicit understanding of what the Lord is up to. Is he is the one who raises up and casts down nations according to his goodwill and his purpose? So we can't discern that. We don't have prophets, and that gift is um, that gift is hidden now that the apostolic age is over. So, so we have to, in some ways, uh, abstract or the the wisdom that we want to learn here, uh, because especially when we when we see for example the blood that's staining the garments you mentioned that uh in the in the lesson and then the blindness that comes along there's a twofold blindness that Jeremiah is going to be writing about and that's distinctly connected to the promises of Deuteronomy the lord threatens them with um that idolatry will result in in blindness and we think that was actually physically happening, that, that people were being blinded either by malnutrition or by sickness or even by by the sword and the assaults of the people. We know that happened with Manasseh, who was blinded and had a hook through his nose. And so um, and so the Lord was afflicting them with specific uh, he had given them specific threats in Deuteronomy, and he, and so it has a specific application. We don't have those same threats and those same promises bound up to the United States. So what we're looking for in the text is wisdom, and um, and there's a lot of wisdom that's here for us, including that 
the Lord does put people in an office of teaching, and it's on those people in the office to teach. They're held accountable for teaching, and if they don't, like Ezekiel warns us, the blood is on the hands of the people that you don't warn. The There's that responsibility given to the office uh, sets up those in the office to go about their work with care, because even because when the Lord authorizes something, that doesn't mean that the person doing it can't mess it up. In fact, it's a warning: Hey, don't mess it up. What What's one example is uh, in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church took the words of Jesus and said, "Whoever hears you, hears me." They said that means whoever listens to the church is listening to God. And the Lutheran said, "Look, you've got that exactly backwards." It's what Jesus is saying is, if you're speaking, you better be speaking the things that I want you to speak. You're, you're, so it's a constraining thing on the servants rather than a uh, expanding thing on those who are hearing. And, and that's the same thing that applies to those in the office now, that we have to be speaking the Lord's law and gospel so that people can, can know his wisdom and not run off in one direction, towards pride, I can do whatever I want, I don't have to worry, or towards despair, I'm doomed and there's no way to be saved. The 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 Spirit works through law and gospel to bring us to repentance, which is our which is our salvation. Just a real quick note from one of the listeners. He wrote in, it's Ryan, and he's asking about our use of uh, Yahweh and uh, Lord, you know, with the Adonai. Would you take just a few minutes to explain that? Because it's it's worth it. We talked about it a little bit yesterday, you know, this being the name of the people. And Jeremiah goes through here and he uses Adonai and then Yahweh, which we end up saying Adonai over I always try to say Lord with the, the proper name Yahweh, especially as we're on the radio and you can't see the distinctions, but just want to give him a quick primer on exactly sure. why we do that. Sure. So there's um, there's probably three Hebrew words that are uh, here to, for us to consider and, and, and two English words that sit on top of it. Um, there's the Hebrew word for Lord, uh, which is Adonai. It can refer to uh, the divine Lord, God, or it can refer to a human Lord as well. I suppose like the Spanish Señor. There's the Hebrew word Elohim, which is translated God, and that's what it means, God, or sometimes gods, idols, um, even uh, those in powerful places, uh, the gods of this world kind of thing. That's Elohim. And then there's the third word, which is the divine name, sometimes called the Tetragrammaton. We pronounce it Yahweh. Uh, it was. It's there in the text. Uh, it's interesting that it's noted most often. It's written down without the vowels, because in the Hebrew custom, in the Jewish custom, it would not have been spoken. It would have rather been um, when it was there on the page, but when it was read, it would have been read Adonai. So you replace the divine name by with the word Lord, and that became a convention in translation. So that instead of translating the divine name Yahweh, it rather says uh, uh, Lord in the text. But to indicate that the divine name is underneath it, the translators of the English have the convention of putting all caps. So whenever you see Lord with all caps, that's a translation of the divine name. Whenever you see Lord without all caps, a capital L, but O-R-D, lowercase, then that's the translation of the word Adonai. There's some special cases that are really interesting. Like, for example, if the Hebrew says uh, Yahweh Adonai, how would you translate that? And you, if you use the normal convention, you would say Lord, Lord, all caps, lower caps. Uh, but the they've changed it so that they use God with all capital letters as the replace for the divine name. So it'll say the Lord God with all capital G-O-D. And then you realize the divine name is underneath. So really, whenever you see all capital letters, you know that underneath that is the divine name, uh, Yahweh. And uh, in more recent times, uh, it has become more common to pronounce the divine name. It seems like it was a pious custom to not pronounce it because, for worry of misusing the name of the Lord your God, the second commandment. Uh, but when the Lord commands us not to misuse it, he's He's also in, implying that we should use it. We should use it rightly to cry out to him in prayer uh, and praise and to give thanks and so forth. 
So that's what's going on there. And it's nice to know. So it's really helpful. Just as an example, when you read Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You'll notice in the English, one Lord is all caps and the other is not, because underneath it, it's Yahweh said to my Adonai, sit here at my right hand. So it's right. important to pay attention to that. Yeah. And I just think it's useful. And so, yeah, thanks for that question. All right. We're going to pick up with 19. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles in the heavens. They chased us on the mountains. They lay in wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, Yahweh's anointed, was captured in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the nations. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who dwell in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup shall pass. You shall become drunk and strip yourself bare. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer, but your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he will punish, he will uncover your sins. And that's where it ends. Uh, not with a ton of, you know, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever and his mercies are new every morning. More with, just because God is using you to punish us doesn't mean you don't have yours coming. Maybe that's maybe that's a little simplistic, but that's how I hear it. No, that's exactly right. I want to make sure that we don't miss this because one of the big problems of the people's lack of repentance was where they were putting their trust. Uh, and so in verse 17, it says, uh, your, your eyes failed, looking for help was useless. In our watching, we've watched for a nation that could not save us. So this is the temptation always of Israel was to look to other places to help. And especially in this context, they were looking to Egypt. They thought that Egypt was going to come and save them so that the prophets have to say, look, Egypt is a broken reed. You can't, if you lean on Egypt, you're going to collapse. Put not your trust in princes. Don't trust in the horses. This is not, your trust should be in the Lord. But they were always putting their trust in people and in nations that could not save. Uh, they hunt so that the nations couldn't help them. And even when they trusted in, this is an, a really interesting verse 20, when it says, the breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pits. This is... I mean, it's very theological language. It's it's saying Yahweh's Messiah, who is called the breath of our nostril. I mean, that goes back all the way to creation when the Lord breathed in Adam. And what Jeremiah is saying, you trusted your king, Josiah maybe, Manasseh maybe, you trusted him like he was your life and he was your deliverer and he was going to be the one to rescue you. And that was wrong. There is only one who is the Lord's anointed, who is the breath of our life, who is to be trusted, the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were putting their trust in not only not in God, where it should have been, but in nations and in false messiahs. And, and that trust will be broken. Men will fail us when we put our trust in them to, to save, to deliver, to rescue. And this, if we just need a sort of a reset as we get ready for the next political cycle, which is now well underway and going to ramp up for the next, who knows, five years. Goodness, it seems like forever. But now we enter this uh, in the intensity of the political cycle for the uh, presidential election and all the other elections. We got to remember this, that we do not put our trust in princes. We do not put our trust in men to deliver us. Our hope is in the Lord. That doesn't mean we don't act. It doesn't mean we don't vote. It doesn't mean we don't get involved. It doesn't mean we don't serve our neighbor. It doesn't mean we don't work to try to make the world a better place. But we we have to put our trust ultimately in the Lord, who alone is strong to save. And because they didn't do that, because they trusted all these other places, now the Lord is going to come down and intentionally cut down their idols. So the Lord is at war with every false gods, with every false god, which is why we don't want to be in league with them. That's interesting. I'm just reflecting on that. You know, we talk about how there is no God but one, and anything you put your faith, hope, and trust in is to you a God or a false God. And there are certainly other false gods out there. Uh, even Satan himself and his minions want to set themselves up as false gods. And 
you know, we say, well, we want to stay away from that because God doesn't like us. He's a he, like that. He's a jealous God. He wants us to be with him alone. But when you look at it from the perspective of God is actively engaging in a war against all the false gods that would try to get his glory from him, then it makes a lot more sense why you don't want to be embedded with them or or even associated with them. And and that's exactly what we've already seen in the previous – well, the previous few chapters it describes as – uh, describes Jerusalem as this woman who has all these lovers, and the lovers, of course, were the surrounding nations to which she was looking for salvation from. And yet, yet God is at war with those nations. Right. I suppose it's like the the warnings that um, uh, if if you're going to s- send a missile in uh, to to blow up a, a, a some sort of military facility, you send the warning to all the civilians, hey, get out of there. We're not fighting you, we're fighting them. So the Lord gives this warning, hey, I'm fighting against the false gods, so get out of there, so you don't get what is intended for them. This is, I mean, this is the doctrine of hell. The Lord has created hell for the devil and his angels, that's what Jesus says. So get out of league with them, because you don't want to go there with them. The And it goes back to this, this foundational idea that we are impressionable stuff. We are made in the image of someone or something, and we're always being shaped into that image. Or and so, and and that that our worship is that shaping of the image. So if we're worshiping God, we're being crafted into the image of His likeness. That's how Paul will talk about it. But if we're worshiping the false gods, we're being shaped into their image. So Psalm 143, maybe, is where this comes up. The, those who, the the idols of the nations are blind and dumb, and they've got feet, but they don't walk. They've got eyes, but they don't see. They have mouths, but they don't talk. And those who worship them, those who make them become like them, and so do all those who worship them. So that in our worship, we are being shaped or impressed with a with a likeness of that which we worship. And that, and if we are worshiping anything but the true and living God, then we are being shaped into a lie that's dying. Uh, it, we, we are being pressed. Death is being pressed into us, which is not what the Lord wants. It's also probably not what we should want, although we seem addicted to it because of the sinful nature. But uh, but the Lord is trying to rescue us from that. So, so even the blindness that's mentioned in Deuteronomy 32, look, you, you disobey me. No, it's not 32. Deuteronomy uh, 28. Deuteronomy 28, 28. Part of the warning that the Lord gives to the people. Look, if you chase after the idols, you'll be struck with blindness. And and that blindness, it shows up. It was here in verse 16, uh, or sorry, verse 14. They wandered blind in the streets. And because they were blind, they would stumble into these piles of blood from the people that they themselves had murdered, making themselves unclean. So they had to walk around town shouting, unclean, unclean. But that blindness shows up in verse 16. Verse 17, your eyes failed looking for help that was useless. You went blind, staring over the horizon, waiting for someone else to come when I was right here in front of you. So that you, so that your blindness is the result of this, of this idolatry. And now it's it's been visited on you in this really profound way. So the Lord is calling us, um, he's calling us out of the war, which he is fighting with the devil and the demons and the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his light, where we have peace with God, the forgiveness of sins. And so, um, so all of this call to repentance is a call away from the violence that the Lord intends for his enemies, but not for us. That's uh, certainly something for us to think about, you know, and remember, especially in, when it comes to who we're putting our faith, hope, and trust in. And especially, as you uh, as you mentioned, we're going into an election season, and it becomes a very difficult time for us, and a lot of division happens over these things. And, you know, I think sometimes what's left, you know, God comes up in the conversation everywhere, but what's left out of the conversation, at least among Christians, is that at the end of the day, the Lord is king, the Lord is in control, um, and, you know, through Jesus, we have access to all of his mercies and gifts. And I'm so grateful that you were on the show with us today. Any last parting thoughts before we let you go? Well, maybe a quick 30 second thing on what happens next at the very end. The Lord, you're right. The Lord says, you are over there, you eat them, you're over there laughing. Well, you're next. But when the, the Lord's wrath is leaving Jerusalem to go to Edom, that's where the relief is. God, 
God be praised uh, for that. So there is a little glimmer of hope uh, that comes at the end. And with the Lord, there's always that hope because, again, he's always pressing us to repentance. And even the reason why he's describing this affliction is so that we would cry out to him and look to him always for help, even in our most desperate time of need. I'd like to say that chapter five then brings in all the gospel like a good Lutheran should, but chapter five, which we're going to cover <laughs> on Monday, it's a little bit more of an anticipation, uh, anticipatory kind of prayer that God's going to save. And we know he does, but y- you get from the sense that we're still being left in this hope for salvation rather than a guarantee of it. But that'll be what we'll talk about on Monday when we wrap up Lamentations with the Reverend Dustin Beck. That would be chapter five. For now, I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Brian Wolfmuller, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church and Jesus Lutheran Church of the Deaf in Austin, Texas. Thanks again for being on the show, taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, as our guest mentioned, um, if you haven't noticed, there is an election coming up. How can Christians navigate the complex world of politics while staying true to their biblical values? Well, tomorrow is our very first First Friday free text episode of the year. And I'll be joined by systematics professor, the Reverend Dr. Joel Bierman from Concordia Seminary. And we'll engage uh, how that we can interact in political discussions with grace and wisdom. This promises to be an hour of insightful conversation and practical guidance on living out your faith in the public arena. Uh, I've entitled it uh, A Christian Approach to Political Discourse, but really it's about how to talk politics as a Christian. So join us for that. As I already said, on Monday, we'll wrap up Lamentations, and then Tuesday, we pick up the Book of Deuteronomy. The uh, Reverend Kevin Parvis will be joining us for that. So there is a lot of stuff coming over the next week, so I hope that you join us for all of it. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all. As we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word. 